Yes, yeah, we do. Perfectly. Yeah, but I don't see it now. <laughs> I don't have to figure out where it is. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so we are on chapter 12 now. <clears throat> this is the first time we, uh, we go to stochastic optimal control. <clears throat> so in the previous chapter, excuse me, is nothing to do with, which is my, it's called post-nasal drip. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's with, with me for some time. In previous chapters, we assumed that the state variable of the system are known with certainty. So what we now do is the state variable itself become a stochastic process. That means it evolved <coughs> over time by some randomness that is there in the environment. And while there are different kind of randomness, nests, if you want, available in the literature, um, but the subject is somewhat complicated and uh, the, the easiest way to incorporate the uncertainty is via what is called a Wiener process. It's also called Brownian motion in the literature. <clears throat> we will talk about that a little bit. In Appendix D.2, we have defined the Wiener process, also known as Brownian motion. And in, in next section, we'll formulate a stochastic optimal control problem governed by <clears throat> a stochastic differential equation. So instead of different equation, differential equation, we will now have a stochastic differential equation. And if the stochastic differential equation is governed by a Wiener process or a Brownian motion, then it is called the Ito's equation, <clears throat> named after a mathematician named Kyushi Ito. And, and those equations are the ones that we're going to be dealing with. And then we maximize the expected value of the objective function rather than the, the rather than maximize profit, we maximize expected profit. So that's <clears throat> The other thing that we want to mention is that the state that you observe, for example, inventory, is fully observed. That means when I, when I say uh, uh, at any instant that this is my inventory, I know my inventory at that point in time. I don't know what my inventory will be exactly in future because it's a stochastic process, but once I get there, I will know what the inventory is. That's called fully observed. It's possible that you don't fully observe the inventory and then the problem becomes more complicated and that's called partially observed control problems. And there's a lot of literature on that. In fact, I have <clears throat> worked on many of those problems myself. And, and uh, <clears throat> I'll say a little bit more about that, but for example, Think about demand being a stochastic process over time. But I don't observe demand, I observe only sales. So that means I don't really observe demand, but via sales, I observe demand partially. So when I observe sale, I can find out conditional distribution of what the demand is given the sales. So that becomes a more complicated problem and uh, if you go into my CV and Ben Susan's CV, we have uh, quite a lot of work on partially observed problems in inventories. And they, they, they're cited in this book as well. So <clears throat> instead of X and U in our previous chapters, I change them to capital X and capital U because they are both stochastic processes. And because I will need, uh, <clears throat> I will need, instead of putting X parenthesis T, I put X sub T. So this is not a vector notation. This is actually the function of time, okay? Uh, this is, you could do the other way, but then there'll be a lot of parentheses all over the place. 
and and this is more standard uh, in in stochastic uh, control literature, but other is also used. It's not it's not it's it is possible to use the other two. And then there is a salvage value function. So we take the expected value instead of because these are random variables. We take the expected value. Then the equation, the state equation, which we had as a differential equation now is given by what is called the Ito's stochastic differential equation. Now notice if I if I have no Wiener process, this is my Wiener process. If I if I remove this, then I can put the dt on this side, it becomes dx d dt, which is x dot, and this becomes x f of x u t. So that that part is nothing but the equation that we are used to in deterministic systems. The reason I put it this way is because that particular that particular term is nowhere differentiable. So if you divide by dt, it you have to find what the meaning is, and I will tell you that the literature has that that formulation as well. But this is more standard. When you write the stochastic differential equation, you write it this way. Notice every stochastic, dif every differential equation only makes sense in terms of how you integrate or solve it. For example, if I have x dot equal to f d f, then I write it dx t is f d t, and the, I integrate on this side, and I integrate on this side because this is the integral when you put the integral. So it only makes sense in terms of how we integrate that equation. So now what happens is I can integrate this, I can integrate this, and I can integrate this. And that integral is called stochastic integral. And we are not going to learn mathematical theory of all of this. So we're going to go more by recipe. OK, recipe means we will know how to do this uh, without going through the, the required mathematics. For the time being, I will make this a scalar equation, only one dimensional. I don't want to do vectors here right now uh, because we're bringing a new theory. Uh, bringing in a vector only makes the notation more complicated. It doesn't really add much to the ex much to the, the the exposition of the theory, and so I just do it one dimensional. So all of that is saying that the functions. G's and F and all that are one dimensional. Uh, if you want to go to multi-dimensional one, there is a book by Fleming and Richelle. You can go there and look at it. Uh, Fleming was one of my co-authors as well. <clears throat> so we assume the function F, this is the, the, the objective function, this is the salvage value, this is the, the, the equation dynamics. We assume that these functions are continuous in their arguments and are continuously differentiable in their arguments. So that's kind of standard because we have to integrate them. And we assume subscript T rather than writing it this way. Some books will write it this way. We, we decided to write it this way. Well, <clears throat> one thing now I have to mention to you that there is a stochastic maximum principle for these problems. Problem is that the stochastic maximum principle A is mathematically complicated, and a B, it is not that useful in the stochastic problems than it is in the deterministic problems. But remember, in, in a deterministic problem, we went to derive the stochastic maximum principle using dynamic programming. We could have used dynamic programming also, but we wanted to learn maximum principle. So we derived that from dynamic programming, although the proof was not very rigorous. There's another proof of maximum principle, which is more rigorous, but we derived a maximum principle for, it, for, for us to be able to use it. In a stochastic problem, the maximum principle is not that much useful, uh, unless for, for mathematical reasons. So we basically go back to dynamic programming. So when the stochastic control problems, we actually use dynamic programming. OK, so if you go to dynamic programming, we have to write a value function. And the value function here is a function of state and t. So I say that 
I have a process, xt, a stochastic process, and I'm at time t right now. And at time t, I observe it to be x. So this is my observation of that process. And so I, I, I put that value in there, and I, I of course know what time it is, so I put that value in there. And then I do what is called the Bellman equation. I use the principle of optimality, which says that I take the value So I go from T to T plus DT. When I go from T plus to DT, I get the value, this value. Okay. And then from DT on, T plus DT on, I will have a new state, which will be that X plus that DXT, which you see here in, 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 in from T to T plus DT in time interval DT. I will change my state to, to, to this state. So that is that state here, x plus dxt. And my time will change from t to t plus dt. So the, the dynamic programming says that if I take the value function at this time, it maximizes my current profit and, and the value function from then point on. This is, this is standard Bellman. The, and we did that, we did that in chapter two, and then in chapter two we expand this this thing by Taylor series, and so all of that is the same. The only thing which is different and it is fundamentally different is that when I expand the Taylor series, I only took the term for the first time, first dt. I did not go beyond two. So I take the mean term and the next term, that's it. And after that, I put small ODT. What happens in, a, in stochastic control problem is that the term in the second order are also meaningful. So I go to Taylor series and I go one more step. Okay, so let's do that. So I do the Taylor series. The first thing is this one. I take the value at VXT, so that is that. Then the first term is we take the derivative of this with respect to t, and I put vt dt. Then I take the derivative of this 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 function with respect to x, and I multiply by dxt. And that's where I stopped in the deterministic case. But in stochastic case, I have to go one more step. And that step is I take the vxx, and I do the dxt square, and also with the dt and also with the cross term dx dt. So I take the derivative, two, two time derivative, and put dx d square, and continue on that. The reason I'm doing it is, is because some of these terms are not ODT anymore. They are large, rather large, and so I want to keep them, and that is because of the way this Wiener process is works. This Wiener process is a very complicated process, uh, but mathematically it is the simplest process. But in terms of in terms of its graphical picture, it is very complicated. Okay. And so this is where the stochastic calculus comes in. And we are just going to again do a recipe rather than de derive all of those things. Although in appendix I've done some work, so I have to open dxt square. I know what dxt is from here, so I can open that. I do the square of this, so I can open this. So this is f square dt square plus d square zt square plus two f times g dzt dt. Okay. Then dxt dt. I just multiply dxt to dt. So that gives you f dt squared and g d s d dt. Those are algebra. So I'm using algebra, almost algebra here. And the exact meaning of these terms come from several books that you can write. <clears throat> but for our purposes, it is enough to know that the d z t squared is the order of dt. 
and all others are order of zero. So ODT. And so I'm going to substitute these for here. And then I'm going to only retain this term and, and, and call this DT. That's right here. All the other terms are going to go, and go to ODT. So, so if you compare the chapter two, you will see that the dynamic programming there only stopped here. And then it had an ODT. And now in chapter 13, 12, I have this additional term. That is a fundamental difference again, that additional term. But once you do all of this, then you stochastic calculus purpose is done, finished. You don't need any more stochastic calculus because now what we have is a, is a differential equation. It's more complicated differential equation, but nevertheless, it's a differential equation. It has no stochastics anymore. So if you can solve this equation, you get value function. And that more or less solves the problem. So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna divide everything by dt. When you divide, first of all, we cancel v and v, both sides. Then we divide by dt, and when you divide by dt, this this term disappears, and I get this. It it may be useful to compare these equations to chapter two equations, which basically have everything except this part. And this one is also there. This is the boundary condition of a value function at time capital T. Any questions so far? There is a there is a appendix D point two where I have given a more mathematical version of you know winner process. And uh, it will be a good idea for you to know it, but it will not be. Um, it will be more for understanding, um, but in terms of solving the problems uh, that that are, that are there in this book and this course, um, you will not need that. But if you are going to work on these problems, write papers yourself, use this theory, it would be good to know more about in the process, especially. People in finance cannot do without it because most of the continuous time finance uses now Brownian motion. And we will see an example of a financial application uh, later uh, in this chapter. So what I will do now is one, derive the current value formulation of this, which is really, uh, we did it differently in, in the deterministic case because I wanted to give you a, a, a derivation from the beginning. But here we can, we don't have to redo this, the, the thing. We might learn a different thing uh, here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to define the current value function and I will derive the current value formula for 12.9 just by doing that. So what I'm going to do now is suppose I have a discounted function, so f is now phi e to the minus rho t, just like we just like we did before. So f is discounted. I remove this t because if this t is still there here, then there is no point discounting the problem because this t will be there anyway. The reason for discounting is the reason for discounting is is when you have uh, uh, no t, no t here. And generally speaking, you also don't do it in a finite horizon problem. You usually do it in just infinite horizon problems. But but we want to derive a current value equation, and that that is good for for infinite horizon problem also. So we define f to be this way and s to be this way. This is the same as what we did in chapter two or three. And then. What we do is we define a current value function. 
and the current value function, ah, just a second, I do it differently. I define a current value function. Uh, well, I should have mentioned a little bit before. Yeah. So the current, this is a present value. Okay, this is a standard formulation. So V is a present value here. To make it a current value, I have to multiply by e to the rho t. Well, the other way, think about it. Present value is the current value e to the minus rho t. So if you bring it on this side, this becomes e to the minus rho t v tilde. V tilde is the current value. And if you if you want the present value, then you multiply by e to the minus rho t and you get the v. By so so that's what it is. So wherever if I multiply v to e to the rho t then I should be able to get a V tilde XT formula. And to know to do that is to go to that equation and, and transform it to current value. Transform it to an equation for V tilde. We have equation for V. We know what V tilde is, so we should be able to get an equation for V times E to the rho T. Okay, so given this, we know that V sub T will be just V tilde T E to the minus rho T. So we take the derivative. So we, you can actually, what you do is you go, bring the E to the rho T on this side, that becomes E to the minus rho T. Then you take the derivative of V with respect to T. So the derivative of V with respect to T is given by this. V sub X is given by this. And V double X X is given by this. We put all of these terms, we substitute for V sub T, V sub X, V sub X, X in here, in here. So the all of this whole thing becomes V tilde. Okay, so once we do that, we substitute, we get this. You see, it's all is V tilde. Okay, and V X, we can, we can easily, we, we, we can easily put V X uh, let me see. So once we substitute that, and what we do is um, we we use these formulas to substitute for vx and substitute for v sub xx. And when we do that, everything becomes v, v tilde. And then the equation becomes v tilde. So you can see right and south is is almost the same as this instead of f becomes phi but the left hand side instead of zero it becomes rho b this is exactly the same we had before in chapter two when you do the current value so now it's a rho v tilde given with this so 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 we can almost go take this phi now worry about this now worry about this and then put the rho here Also, this is very easy because we define it so. So if you took the if you took the SXT to be psi of XT to the minus rho T, and you you know what V sub T is, this is this is so V X T would be exactly equal to SXT E to the rho T. And we can then uh, use this formula to find the terminal condition for V tilde. So V tilde is just psi x, which is also you, you can also economically argue that this is this is the, the, the this is the value at capital T in present value terms. So if I were to do a current value here, then this goes away. So I get this. So we have two formulas, one for present value, one for current value. They are equivalent but we will use both of them in different problems. One more thing. If I were to have an infinite horizon here, if I put infinite horizon here, then I don't have, the, I don't need this because at infinity, if this is, this is finite or it is not growing very fast, uh, it's not going faster than rho, which we have to assume, 
because if it grows faster than rho, then we have a problem that we had in chapter five at infinity. So we, we as long as that happens, we don't need this term because it all goes to zero. And so you put t equal to infinity here, and we have a new problem, an inferior problem, which is like this. This is the objective function. This is the differential equation. And now our, our value function equation is the same as before. But what we need is that we don't have this anymore. OK? And because we don't have this anymore, we need some condition. And the, what we need is a condition on growth, growth of this value function. And generally speaking, the growth is of the same form as the, as the, as the objective function. So if the phi is quadratic, then we assume Vx to be quadratic growth. That means it is, its growth is in x squared. But for more complicated problems, you have to go to <clears throat> some references to see what growth conditions are suitable. OK. Any questions so far? Because we are done with the theory of stochastic control. We are now going to apply this to three different problems. <clears throat> So the first problem we apply is the inventory control. We have done this before uh, in chapter uh, six. I sub t is the inventory level at time t, p sub t is the production rate at time t. If you go back to chapter six, you will see the same problem in some way. The constant demand rates, I, 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 I'm, I may not have a constant demand rate because I could do more things there, but here, since I'm, I'm introducing stochastic problems, I want to simplify some of the stuff so that, that we, we don't have too many other issues that are not important at this point, and they can be easily handled. T is the length of horizon, I0 is the initial inventory level, B is the salvage value per unit at time T, standard Wiener process, and sigma is the constant diffusion coefficient. Oh, the word diffusion just arrived here. It turns out that when you solve this equation, you get the stochastic process xt. When there's a Wiener process here, then this stochastic process xt is called the diffusion process or Markov diffusion process. That's just the terminology. And we can... So the IT would be a diffusion process. DIT is very, very, very clear. It's production minus sale times DT, and that's a random variable, sigma DZT. And I also noted in section D.2 that in old fashioned books on stochastic control, this DZT was given another name <clears throat> and so you had a so if you divide this by dt so if we divide by this dt then you get i dot here pt minus s here then you get sigma dz dt and dz dt was formally written as wt and it's called white noise <clears throat> in the end it's just a notation, okay? And what the notation means is how you work with it. And so there is a there is a calculus for white noise, uh, which which would, would would take care of it. But that calculus is now not fashionable anymore. What is fashionable is stochastic calculus, with where you don't it, then you don't divide by dzt by dt anymore. So you don't even bother with this WT. <clears throat> but this could be inventory spoilers, sales returns, stuff that is random in inventory problems. Uh, so this is the deterministic part of the equation. And this is the stochastic part of the equation. I want to minimize the cost. So I want to maximize the negative of the cost. The cost is given by, notice we had, in chapter six, 
we had something called PT minus something, IT minus something square. Those were called the goal levels. I think it was PT minus P bar. <clears throat> we're going to assume the goal levels to be zero, just to simplify our notation. So if you go to chapter six and you put the goal level to be zero, you get this cost. And then I get some value at inventory. I sell this in aftermarket. I get B for every unit. So that is the revenue that I get. And if that's so that's my that's my revenue minus cost that I want to. But but see, I want to maximize. So I want to maximize the revenue minus the cost. OK. Again, I want to introduce here stochastical <coughs> introduce. Stochastic control, so I'm going to allow production less than zero, which is called disposal if needed. Remember in chapter six, first we ignored this in the sense that we allowed this. And then at the very end of the chapter, <clears throat> I forced the PT to be bigger than or equal to zero, and I resolved the problem using maximum principle. Here, most of this, <clears throat> we're going to assume that this allowed. That's not going to happen if your inventory is sufficiently, if your inventory is not too high. If the inventory is too high, the cost of holding is too high, and so it is possible to dispose it very quickly or dispose it at some rate because, because you, you want to not have so high inventory. So PT less than zero may be optimal, mathematically at least. <clears throat> uh, and that's so that's what we're gonna do. If you don't, if you don't know for this, and if you impose PT bigger than or equal to zero, then the problem becomes more complicated. And Ben Susan and I wrote a paper just changing that to PT bigger than zero in this problem because I had this problem already solved before, and this was in my first edition of the book. Uh, and then Ben Susan came to visit me in Toronto, <clears throat> and we wrote a paper making PT bigger than or equal to zero. <clears throat> and that paper is uh, appeared in Siam Journal of Control in 1980 or something. So or 1990 maybe, I don't, don't know the year now but it's it's cited in the book. So if you want to go to that PT bigger than zero, you will see that it requires numerical solution. There's no closed form solution for the problem. But if we allow this, there's a closed form solution. <clears throat> That's why I'm allowing it. So I'm going to now use this finite horizon problem. <clears throat> I'm not using current value formulation, so I'm going to now use this equation. Okay. We, we substitute the value of f, we, we know what f is, and we know what g is, okay? So we're going to substitute those and get an equation which looks like this. So this is, this is zero on this side because it's a, it's a present value. Optimal control is, p is our control variable, and this is our f, this is v sub t, this is V sub X. No, this is our this is our objective function. This is our objective under the this integral in the objective function. This is V sub t. This is V sub X times small f. Small f is P minus S. And 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 G is G is half sigma square. No, G is exactly sigma square. Half is already here. <clears throat> so this is the equation that we want to solve. Boundary condition is d times x. So if you had a value x at time t, then we will get so much money by selling that x. So now this is a differential equation. And I'm going to maximize this rest to p, so I'm going to take the derivative of this and set it to zero. So that's what happens. And I take the derivative of this, set it to zero, 
I get this formula for P star. So anytime my inventory is X, my time is T, and if I knew the value function, then I take the derivative of the value function and two and set this to be my production rate. Notice now that quantity can be negative, especially when X is very high. So I'm allowing that because if I don't allow, then first order condition will not work at zero. And I will let, then you need to use Kuhn Tucker conditions, and that makes it probably more difficult. <clears throat> what I need to do is this. We did that in chapter six. And when you do that, the problem becomes more difficult. And 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 this is solved in Ben Susan uh, and Sethi paper. <clears throat> So once I have this, I can substitute that for this P here and the P here, and I can remove the max because I maximize over P already. And what I get is this equation. This equation is a partial differential equation in V. You see V sub T, V sub X, V sub sub X. And in this course, we are not assuming the knowledge of partial differential equations. We are assuming the knowledge of what it is. We are not assuming the knowledge of how to solve it. So a partial differential equation is an equation where you have an unknown, which is value function, and the terms can involve the first derivative, second derivatives, cross derivatives, uh, um, for its, uh, uh, with respect to its arguments. The arguments are X and T, so you can see the derivative with respect to X and with respect to T. So, so we get same equation in chapter six, except this part. <clears throat> and that makes it more difficult. But there's a solution to this problem. <clears throat> And the solution of this problem is by guesswork. And if I give you problems of this kind, I will give you some sort of hint as to what the guess is. OK, so I may give you this is the form of the value function. And I ask you to find, find Q, R, and M. So what I'm saying is that the value function is quadratic because I have a quadratic problem here, and this is known to be in the literature that for such problems, the value function is quadratic. So I put quadratic. And then given this form, I can use this form to try to solve this equation. OK, if I don't guess it right, then I will find that it is not going to work out for me. There will be a contradiction and you have to make another guess. <clears throat> And maybe there is no guess. Uh, maybe there's no closed form solution like this, in which case you have to do either uh, characterize the solution or do the numerical solution. So if I do that, I can find V sub T, which is given by this. Remember this Q dot now. So I take Q dot X square, R dot X and M dot. V sub X is two Q X plus R, V sub X is just two Q. And I substitute these guys in this equation. Because I have V sub T, V sub X, V sub I can substitute all of these. When I substitute this, I get this equation. When I've collected the X squared terms, X terms, and a, and, a, and a term that doesn't that doesn't have an X in it. But this is zero. <clears throat> and this is zero. So if you put this to be zero, then it has to be zero everywhere. That means what I'm trying to say is it is it it is zero independent of X. For every X, 
this is zero. I mean, not this one. For every x, this quantity is zero. Well, it can only be zero if the, if this is identically equal to zero, and that's identically equal to zero, and this this term that is that doesn't have an x is identically equal to zero. Because if we vary x, it will not be zero if these guys are not zero. And since this is whole true for all x, then coefficient of x squared should be zero, coefficient of x should be zero, and coefficient not coefficient of constant term should be zero. So I get these three equations. By doing this equal to zero, I get a differential equation. By this equal to zero, I get another differential equation. By this equal to zero, I get another differential equation. So so we get three. So so here's what's going on. We have a partial differential equation, which we want to solve. Fortunately, we have a form that we think will be a solution of this equation. So we assume this form to be so. Then we, given this form, that equation reduces, that one PDE reduces to three ODE. ODE means ordinary differential equation. So these are three ordinary differential equations. Notice we can also solve, we, we can also plug this, this formula, I'm sorry, this formula at capital T in this in this terminal condition, this one. And when we do that, we also find that <clears throat> QT equal to zero, RT equal to B and MT equal to zero. Okay, any question here? This comes from right away here, because V V V X capital T is B times X. So this is zero, this is zero, and R T equal to B. Like that. Well, each one of them are easy to solve. <clears throat> Let's go one by one. There are many ways to solve that, but the way I've done it is I take I take the partial fraction of this. So I, I, I change this to one minus Q times one plus Q. So I have, and I bring it on this side, Q dot divided by one minus Q times one plus Q equal to equal to Z, equal to, equal to, equal to one. Okay. And then I, I change this one minus one minus one minus Q squared by this this for this partial fractions, which is easy to do. Notice if you if you if you if you combine them, you'll get one divided by one minus q squared. And <clears throat> I integrate. So q dot divided by one minus q is a log. Q dot divided by one plus q is another log. And so you can actually solve this problem. And and when you solve this problem, we find that Q is given by, uh, I simplify it by defining Y, otherwise I write too many stuff here, and Q is given by this formula, these two formulas. This is simpler. If S is constant, then S dot becomes zero. Now if S is constant, then um, then we define um, I'm just trying to see here. We change it to uh, <clears throat> we reduce twelve point three three, which is this equation. We can reduce this to R0, where R0 is given by R minus 2S. Okay. And when when S is constant, there's no, 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 this is not S of T anymore. And we can integrate this formula here. It's a first order equation. So we can integrate 
uh, there are many ways to integrate, but this is even simpler because it's r dot equal to uh, uh, r zero by q. So you can put q on this side, and you get r dot zero divided by q equal to r zero, and then you can take the integral of that, and you get a log. Oh no, I'm sorry. You get sorry, you get r dot zero equals minus r zero q. R0, we can divide this by R0, so you get R dot 0 divided by 0, plus Q equal to 0. This Q can be on this side, so it becomes minus Q. R0 dot R divided by R gives you log. So you take the integral of this side from 0 to T. I get log R0 T minus log R0. On this side is minus Q T, so integral becomes from T to T, Q tau D tau minus. And then we go back here and we can find out the formula for R. We already defined the Y before, <clears throat> so you can also get the formula for R. The last one is M. M is straightforward because there's, there's only M dot and these things are known to us. So you just take the integrate. And I did that. Okay. So now, the optimal control, which is V sub X by T, and we exactly know what V sub X is, we can write the optimal control to be this formula. This means that the optimal position at T is P star, which is a P star of IT star T, because IT star is the optimal inventory path under this control P star, and we are saying that this optimal path is to produce equal to sale plus some adjustment, which depends on the current value of inventory and time t. And if I put some value of b, I can actually solve this equation. And so this is P star T, and this, when you put P star T in this equation, X dot equation, which is our state equation, this one, I can solve for IT. So that's what's going on here. So, sample path of optimal production rate. Yeah, there's some there's some mistake here. My goodness, the person drawing the picture and I didn't proof it. It's typos, uh, which are sometimes hard to spot. Okay, sorry about that. So this should be PT star, and this should be IT. Okay. I, I can handle this to be XT, but this should be IT. Okay, um, what can you do? Um, this needs to be corrected. Okay, so now I plot this graph. I plot this graph for for initial value two and time t12, and I put b, which is the value of inventory at 20, and five sales rate and sigma equal to two. You can sort of see that, sort of see that if I have an inventory two, I'm going to produce little less than five, and then I'm going to basically reduce the inventory and then stay inventory at the goal level, which is zero. But if my B is sufficiently high, then I'm going to have to start producing a lot until I get all the way to here. So there's a terminal value 
of it that I want to end up with because I'm going to be if B is less than there, maybe I can go up to here. If B is zero, maybe I don't need to do anything. I can just continue. And so, so that's basically what's going on here. This is the Brownian motion for you. It is a, it is not something. Uh, this is just a pictorial representation of that. But the Brownian motion is. There's no there's no interval between this this part and this part. It's it's basically like this. There's there, there's no no very differentiable function, and it's impossible to to graph uh, the exact Brownian motion. So this is kind of how we tell you what the Brownian motion is. OK. Any question here? One can also draw a graph for PT. But I did not do it. It would maybe or it, it's also it should be interesting to draw a graph for PT. Maybe I will do that someday. OK. So we solve one problem. You can sort of see the optimal position rate equals the demand rate plus the correction term, which depends on the level of inventory and the distance from the horizon. Uh, we we had some similar result in chapter six as well. It's also clear that y minus one is less than zero. This is y. This is y. And if you look at y minus one, it's less than zero for t less than t. Uh, I'm talking to you about y minus one because here's a y minus one. Here's y y plus one. So so that's that's where the y minus one comes from. And it's clear from the lower values of x that optimal rate is likely to be positive. However, if x is very high, the correction term will become smaller than minus s, and the optimal control will be negative. Notice while the while the control is here. That's the production is approximately five. Okay. Because this there's still a fluctuation, so the production will also fluctuate. But it's kind of fluctuate around the state will fluctuate around zero and the production will fluctuate around five. Okay. If the demand rate was time dependent, it is not a problem because we can just go back to our, go back to our, if it's time dependent, so I can still integrate it. It's maybe more complicated to integrate. If the demand is time dependent, I can still formula, get this formula uh, by, 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 by doing, oh, this is for the S constant. If S is not constant, I may still solve this equation uh, because there will be there will be s of t here, and and when I integrate this, I need to take into account of that. But once I have the formula integrated those equations, then the formula of p star will still be this. Q and r will depend on that s, but the formula will, in terms of Q and r, will be the same as we have right now. If t is infinity. We know we have y goes to zero, and so we know that the p star x t will go to s minus x. That means you you produce if the inventory is x, you produce s minus x, and if the if the inventory is minus if the minus three, maybe you produce uh, five plus three eight. So that's what I'm trying to say is you produce the the uh, the production should be exactly the 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 demand. Minus the inventory we have. Okay. The other observation is that if I have infinity here, if I have infinity here, and maybe even remove this, um, then this problem will be. Remember, PT squared is going to go roughly to S. So this will be around five, and if we, and this may be zero roughly. But even if you integrate this around five, this whole thing becomes infinity, zero to infinity. 
of some constant or close to constant will be infinity. And, and that will be for every production, not just optimal production. So we have no way to distinguish which is good, which is not good. So in that case, you need to formulate a different problem, which is called longer than average cost problem. And we don't we don't get into that 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 literature here. And the other way, which is which we do go into here, is to put discounting. So you use the discounting rate here. Yeah, you put e to the minus rho t here, you put the e to the minus rho capital T here, and then you use the current value formulation, and you can uh, find the equation and solve this problem. If this is given to you as an exercise. Thank you. Exercise 12.2. Any questions so far? We already draw this picture. This is the picture which is right here. You can sort of see and if the horizon time t is long enough, the optimal control will bring the inventory level to the goal level I had, which is zero in this case. This is comparison with chapter six. It will then hover around this level until t is sufficiently close to horizon t. And then at, at horizon t, because the ending phase, the optimal control will try to build up the inventory level response to the positive valuation for b. So that's that's what's going on in this figure. It's sort of going around there, over around this zero, and then it has to go and build the inventory so that it is valuable inventory can be sold. That's just for that's just for the purpose of illustration. You know, generally, uh, <clears throat> um, uh, depends on you know what value b you put. Um, some some people would put b equal to zero because there's no value uh, of inventory at capital T. Then this this formula can go like this. But I want to show you that the effect of b here. Uh, the next model. Remember, all of these chapters are recipes. We cannot. Uh, do stochastic control, uh, uh, especially because of the level of mathematics required. But also, there is uh, this book is more on a deterministic control, except the last two chapters. And uh, stochastic control would be almost a course all by itself. So, it just to cover the uh, important topics in 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 in. in in inventory literature and in advertising literature that I'm covering this to this topic. In chapter seven, we saw a problem of Vidale Wolf advertising model. If you want to compare the Vidale Wolf advertising model to what I'm doing here, you're going to remove this term. That's the first part. The second thing you're going to do is you remove the square root. So that becomes Vidal level of advertising model. And the third thing you're going to do is to remove this u square. You just make it u. So that is exactly the Vidal level model in chapter seven when I do all of these three things. So what I now do is I'm going to add first this to make the problem stochastic. And I put an expected value there when I do this. When I do that, and I still keep the vidal wolf model here, I was not able to solve the problem. I mean, I wanted a solution in explicit form. Numerically, maybe you can, but explicitly I couldn't. And so I tried to change the model. And one change I did was square root of one minus X. And the other change I did is make the cost convex so that uh, the advertising cost is UT squared.
Okay. Uh, this is not necessary, but I, I, I can I can discount the problem, put infinity, so that's not a problem. This was what we did in Vidal and Wolf. We had discount rate and we had zero to infinity. So I changed the Vidal and Wolf model to this model. And when I did that, I was able to solve the problem. And that solution appeared in my 1983 paper. So that's now what's called the SETI model because there are maybe at least 30, 40 papers, at least I know that are written on SETI model. Uh, many of them are written by me and my co-authors, but others are written by others. Um, and, and at least I'm planning to write a book one day on this. Um, so that's the, that's the model. And the reason this model appears in this book is because I can solve this model. And so that's where we go. We start with, we already know Brown in motion. So, the, so one thing that you need to do in SETI model is to make sure that somehow this X, remember in Vidal Wolf model, this, if you begin with the X, which is in between zero and one, there was a market share, X is a market share. I want market share to be always between zero and one. Because if it's not, then I have to impose the constraint on X, which is a state constraint. Even in, in the deterministic case, it's chapter four. Stochastic is even more complicated. The state constraints are quite complicated. Um, one of my co author wrote a book and also did his thesis on this kind of problems with state constraints. That's Mitty Sonner at uh, Brown University. He's now a professor at Princeton. And I wrote some papers with him on problems with state constraints, but that's not a problem right now. So I want to keep this between zero and one. And fortunately, there's a theory that says that if I begin with X zero, which is zero and one, and if sigma X satisfies certain conditions, which are reasonable conditions, then this X process will stay between zero and one almost surely. And that's what I'm going to go next. It's, it's, it's something that is uh, needed for, for this to be rigorous. So I have to assume that sigma X is bigger than or equal to zero in, in the interior, and that the, at the border is equal to zero. So what I'm now saying is that if I'm at zero, then this is going to be zero. There is no noise at zero inventory. Similarly, there is no noise at one inventory. So if I have a full market, I will stay at full market, uh, or I can um, uh, decline from the full market, depending on what I use as U, then, uh, then there is no noise. There is no stochastic term at that point in time, or that level. So that's the condition. Then there is a theorem in a mathematical book, which is Gichman Skorokhod, 1972, the Russian mathematicians. And um, so Gichman Skorokhod said that if control is strictly bigger than zero in this interval, and if the initial value of the control is bigger than zero, then XT process will almost surely stay between zero and one. And so, if that's the case, then I I will just have to I have to show that this is true in my model, and I can tell you that it is it is so. So when we solve this problem, we'll find that our control. Our control will be advertising, this advertising, and our control will satisfy, is a feedback control, so it depends on X. It will satisfy this condition, and it will satisfy this condition. And notice, sigma zero, sigma one equal to zero. I can assume that, but one of the formula that we assume in this, not now, 
we have written papers in which we, we solve this problem numerically, then I need to know ex exactly what it is. So I have assumed sigma constant sigma times x times 1 minus x. So if you take sigma times x times 1 minus x, then it is it, this condition is satisfied. Because x times 1 minus x will be 0 at x and it will be 0 at 1. So that's, that's, the, that's the one we have looked at for this sigma x, but it is true in general as long as this condition is satisfied. So I use the current value formulation of the maximum principle or non maximum principle of the value function, and I go back just to show you. I go back to the current value formulation, which is this. No, 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 no. Where's the current value? This equation, 12.15. So we're going to use 12.15 this time to solve the SETI model advertising problem. So that's 12.15. And now we want to solve this problem. So what we do is we take the derivative of this with respect to u. And when we do that, we find that u star x, because this will be 2u, and there will be another term coming from here. So we find the u star x is r times v sub x times square root of 1 minus 3y by 2. We can show that the vx is bigger than 0, and 1 minus x is bigger than 0, so u star 0 will be bigger than 0, or bigger than equal to 0. That's all I want. And what is u0? Let me see, what is it? There was a condition that we needed. We need u0 strictly bigger than zero, and we will see that that is also true. u0, this would be one, and this is strictly bigger than zero, so this would be bigger than zero, and zero is one. So we are, we are good. We don't need to impose state constraints. I can substitute this in there and there. And then I can remove max. And then I have an equation that looks like this. It looks quite complicated. It says a v squared x squared, which is complicated. Vx squared, it has v sub x, it's got v double x, x. It's quite complicated. Somehow, I was able to solve this problem because I had a certain insight here that said that if I can create a problem so that the value function is linear, and if the value function is linear, then this term will go to zero. And then the equation becomes simpler. So this equation, when this term goes to zero, becomes simpler to solve. And I was able to show that the solution of this form is ax plus b, which is a linear function. And I was able to show that ax plus b, a is lambda bar, and b is this constant, and b lambda bar is equal to this. So this is your a, which is this, and, and a b will be square of that, or r square divided by four rho. How do you make sure that this is a solution? Well, what you do is we substitute the v, v, v sub x, we take the x, vx, which we can put it here. If you take the derivative, this, of this x so is a lambda bar, so I put lambda bar here. And if you take vx x x, it's zero, so it goes zero. And we can solve, we can show that if the equation is satisfied. So the explicit formula now that v sub x 
is lambda bar x. So V sub x is actually lambda bar. Then my formula for u star x is this. Very simple formula. And that says, that says that if my x t is less than x bar, I use the max, I use the u bar control. And if it's x t is bigger than bar, then I have a control which is less than u bar. And if it's x t equal to x bar, I use the control u bar. This is my x bar. And this is my u bar. And this is my formula for control. So it's explicit, completely explicit. I didn't draw a picture here because the picture is, there's be another picture in chapter 13 where I use the SETI model in a game theory context. And again, we can solve the problem. And that's where I would do, do some pictures. So I did not uh, create another picture here. Well, there's another, I, I don't know if it's a typo, but this should be capital X bar. Uh, these are these are not considered <laughs> a big big typos, but I was better to fix them. They they are not mistakes. It just kind of typographical errors in some way. <clears throat> So we have a third model, which is the most sophisticated model in this in this stochastic control chapter. And this is a large literature on this. And this literature is called investment consumption problem or consumption investment problem, or consumption portfolio problem. And it has, I, I think this literature goes all the way back to Samuelson in 69, Paul Samuelson who was the famous economist. And then uh, his student Merton, who writes a paper in 1973 on this problem and Merton, got the Nobel Prize in economics. And so literature goes a long back and a lot of famous people have been involved in this particular problem. So we formulate, so I'm just let me go to introduce the problem then we can take a break. Uh, in example 1.3, we started the rich right here who wants to consume his wealth in a way that will maximize his total utility of consumption and bequest. But in that example, Rich kept his money in savings plan, earning some interest rate of R strictly bigger than zero. And we solved several versions of this problem as we went along. And now we are at the final turn of this problem. We are now allowing Rich the possibility of investing in the stock market. Stock market can have several stocks. And we're assuming, so let's 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 start with this. We assume that there's one risk security or stock. There's only one stock. And that earns an interest rate, that earns dividend or whatever, it's the rate of return is alpha, which is, which is bigger than R. The expected rate of return alpha is bigger than R. The there's a stochastic rate of return, but its expected value is bigger than R. 
Basically, that's called a risk premium. No one will invest in a risky security if not no one, but people will not. People will expect more from a risky security than an interest rate in a savings account. Okay. If I want to take a risk, I should earn a little bit more than what I get in, get from the bank. So we, the, so the rich, I, I, the the guy rich rentier's name has become rich investor, and the rich investor has the possibility to invest his money in a risk-free saving account, and a risky stock. In order to maximize his consumption. The only thing I want to say this is that even though I assume one stock, if there are many stocks, thousands of stocks in the market right now, then there's a theorem called mutual fund theorem. It says, and it's quite general theorem actually, it says that if you have many, many stocks, then you can form a mutual fund, which has a different proportion of these stocks. And if you want to spend $100 optimally or invest $100 optimally, you will maybe putting $1 in this stock, 50 cents in this stock, one penny in that stock, $300 or $50 in that stock and so on. So that's how you invest your $100. And when you invest $100, this mutual fund will give you a rate of return, which will be proportional to each rate of return for different stocks, according to the money you invested into this stock. And theorem says that you are indifferent between investing in the stock market separately in these stocks, or putting the money in a mutual fund. So the mutual fund is consists of the different proportion of the stock. And you just put money in the stock and the proportion will be taken care of by the fact that the mutual fund is constituted by stocks in different proportion. And that proportion uh, remain fixed for individual with a certain utility function. And so what I'm trying to say is that assuming one stock is not so, so specific because I can always form a mutual fund, and then I will need to assume that the rate I return on mutual fund, expected rate is going to be bigger than R. That's all. That's all I need to assume there. So if I have a risk-free account, then it runs interest R. So this is how my state equation for the risk-free account is. If I have an initial value S0 in the mark in the risk-free account, then the differential equation is given by DST equal to RST DT. There is no stochastic component to it because it's a risk-free account. Stock market, since I'm assuming one stock right now, the price of the stock is P sub T. And You've seen literature in finance, which assume this form for the stock return dynamics. If you change this form this way, it's, it's like this. DPT, change in price in a small interval of time, is given by alpha PT, where alpha is the expected value of return, and some variance. Um, these two equals the same. This is standard done in 1971, who received the Nobel Prize. Black and Scholz. Scholz received the Nobel Prize in 73, uh, not 73, um, whenever he received the prize. I, these are the papers they wrote. And Black uh, is no more, he died. So they had to give the prize only to the person who was living, which is Martin Scholz. Because this is Brownian motion, it's multiplied by PT. On this side is DPT. And if you take the integral of DPT, DPT, PT, you get log PT, D log PT. 
So the, you can write this as d log pt. I, I wrote it somewhere, maybe. Let's see? No, I didn't do it. But it's, it's d log pt is dpt by pt. So this 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 equation is also called logarith logarithmic Brownian motion. So you can show that the stock behaves according to a logarithmic by Brownian motion. Okay. So this is continuous time finance. So the Merton formulated the first paper in continuous time finance on portfolio consumption problem. Samuelson had already formulated in discrete time. And that paper, the Merton's paper, is 1973, I think. This is the, this is only for this prize, but the paper that he wrote uh, that that formulated this problem. I'm sorry, I got too far. That's 1973 in general of economic theory. So let's formulate that problem. Okay. Uh, we take a break here. Uh, I'm going to get to this formulation. Uh, um, I got a little bit of history for you, and now let's 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 take a break and formulate this problem. When we come back, so the 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 notion of the notation will be fresh in our mind. Okay. So let's take five minute break. Oh, before I go, are there any questions so far? Because it's going, because it's recipe, it is, there's no really math involved here. Uh, everything is kind of straightforward uh, at the level that we are teaching it. Uh, but if you go deeper into it, it's, it's a lot more math. Uh, but, uh, but most of the papers that you will see in, in literature uh, follow this, this, this recipe kind of formula. Uh, or recipe kind of procedure, and that's that's what I'm covering right now.
Okay, everybody back? Yes, I am. Yeah. Yes, Professor. Thank you. Uh, let me uh, go back to the place. So the Richard Investors problem now is that we WT denotes the wealth at time t. Remember, this is our state variable. We observe it. Okay. So at any time t, I know my wealth. I don't know my wealth tomorrow, but I know it today. That's that's all what that, that means. Okay. Um when you don't know something about your wealth even today, then the problem becomes partially observed problem. And that may be because uh, you might want a real time wealth and there's the inflation that you may not be able to observe. And there are things, and we have written some papers on those as well. Um, so they, 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 I worked a lot on this problem. And so I have tons of paper on this. Um, CT is the consumption rate at time T. In, I, I actually have a book on it too. So CT is the consumption rate at time T. QT is the fraction of the wealth invested in stock at time T. One minus Q then the fraction of the wealth kept in the savings account. If you assume, if you put C as a consumption utility, C is a consumption rate, then you see the utility of consumption. We assume that to be increasing in C and concave. So there's a marginal of diminishing utility. Uh, rho is the rate of discount applied to consumption utility and be the bankruptcy parameter to be explained later. So the wealth equation is given by this. Remember QTWT is invested in the stock market. So it earns alpha DT uh, uh, at the mean rate of return. And then the, 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 the risky part of it is QTWT times sigma DGT. So this gives you the mean plus the risk on it. So the total return is given by together these terms, but the mean of that is alpha because mean of that is zero. One minus QTWT is in the savings account. So it earns R. So that's your DT part for the savings account. And then minus CT DT, if you're consuming at this rate, this is the amount you're going to be consuming in the next interval of DT. So you have your wealth equation. You can re reform that equation uh, this way, and then W0 is given to you. Okay. So if you reform it this way, you can sort of see that alpha minus R is kind of the the, uh, the difference of rail of return uh, and, and it's kind of opportunity return because you could almost earn R and then this is RW, you earn, uh, you earn your interest and then you use part of the interest in consuming. And then there is the, the component, which is the, it's, it doesn't matter. That, that's, that, that's a better explanation anyway. I already give this. Now we assume, so there are some mathematical subtleties here when you write these. And, and if you read these papers, you will see, you will read, you will see those things. Uh, these are long papers in some way, but you will see that in a continuous time, I have to assume that the, the trader can continuously trade. And we are assuming that there is no broker's commission. If you do the broker's commission, then the problem becomes more difficult because um, there's a transaction cost. If it's a fixed cost, then you uh, even more difficult. Uh, recently, I sent you a paper on SS policy. All of the inventory paper with fixed cost give you SS policy, which means that if you put a fixed cost here, there will be some sort of SS policy kind of argument that is going to come here. Uh, and there are some papers on that front as well, but but we are not going to get into that. And the change in wealth DWT from time is due to the consumption as well as the change in share price. And for a rigorous development of that equation, you can actually read Pearson Pliska, which is a very nice paper uh, published in 1981. Uh, these people are 
Henderson, Michael Henderson is a is an OR professor at Stanford, um, and and has got a lot of paper on fluid um, approximation, and Stanley Fliska um, was a professor at Chicago, and and they wrote a, a, a kind of a tutorial kind of paper uh, on 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 how to formulate this kind of equations. We assume that each can borrow unlimited amount and invest in stock. And at some point, his wealth could fall to zero. At that time, he goes bankrupt. And the problem stops. And that time is given by T, inf of T bigger than or equal to zero when WT goes to zero. That time, it's called stopping time. It is stopping time because you will observe this process. And when you observe it to be zero, the problem is stopped. And that only will be known to you at that time. T. You won't know it before when it's coming. Only know the probability of it, distribution of it, but you don't know. You know it when it's coming, that's called stopping time. That's how I describe stopping time. And there are a lot of inventory papers uh, and, and management science papers that have a stopping time. Okay, so this is not something, Su Chiang has a papers where you use this formula. In some of the seminars that we get presented in our seminars, in OM seminars, you will see sometimes the stopping time uh, coming into the play. So this is the definition of stopping time. So the objective function is to maximize the utility of consumption. And at the stopping time, there is some payoff, you call it a B, because your wealth has gone to zero. And the B can be anywhere from minus infinity to plus infinity. It's minus infinity if you behave like 1939 to 19, when, 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 when the first depression came and there were people who became bankrupt and they jumped off the Empire State Building and committed suicide. So that would, that would I would call that to be minus infinity, cost of bankruptcy. The B can also be positive if at the bankruptcy you get uh, go to a halfway house where you get a free meal and government takes care of you and there's a subsidy taken, so subsidy subsidizing social welfare system, then it could actually be positive. It could also be negative, not minus infinity, but you have a remorse. And uh, in all societies, if you became bankrupt, there was a curse on you. People call you bankrupt, bankrupt, bankrupt. And so there is a cost of that. So whatever. Each individual can figure out what the B is, and each individual has to be figuring out what their consumption, utility of consumption is. That's not easy to do, but mathematically, that's how we try to think of an individual's consumption uh, problem. Now, my book, this is my book. My book on this problem is called Portfolio Consumption Problem with Investment Consumption Problem with Bankruptcy, because the, the 1973 paper by Merton did not include bankruptcy. So when they wrote the paper, which is the seminal paper in the literature, and because they did not include bankruptcy, there were some issues in the sense that there, in many cases, their solution was not correct. And uh, Sethi and Taxer, there's a paper cited in my book, Sethi and Taxer. Uh, we went and pointed out the mistakes in the Merton paper and published our paper in Journal of Economic Theory in the same journal where the other paper was published. And we pointed out some mistakes. And then later, uh, a team of people, uh, which is now somehow, I'm going to find out where that is, this one. This is a, 
Krauss's last key set is three paper in 1986 in MOR, Math of Operations Research. And it's also called KLSS paper because it was again a seminal paper, um, well cited in the literature. It is the first paper that actually resolved the Merton problem correctly. Okay, so with that little history, I'm back to my problem. So that we are interested in maximizing the utility of consumption and, and some value of stopping time. And we have a dynamics given and the CT is bigger than equal to zero. Why Merton problem was incorrect? Because in many of his cases, CT actually become negative. The optimal consumption became negative. We are not allowed to have a negative consumption. But the paper was published in general economic theory. People did not realize that the consumption was coming into negative because there are long, long formulas and nobody kind of looked at it. Several theses got written on Merton paper in finance departments until Sethi and Taxer came out and said, hey, some of their consumption is becoming negative. That is not quite correct. And then we resolved the problem. Resolving the problem was not easy at all because once you start putting constraint into account, then the problem becomes more difficult. And I will tell you later on that the, the problem that we're going to formulate is exactly going to be a Merton problem, except with certain assumptions, which would require that this, this, this condition is automatically satisfied. So you don't have to worry about it. Okay, and so that is part of the Merton paper. Part of the Merton paper, this is automatically satisfied. Part of the paper where it's not, and that, that's where he makes mistakes. And, and just continue on. Uh, we can use our value function formula for, for, for uh, current value formulation, and we get this. We have two controls, C bigger than or equal to zero and a Q, which is the portion we invest in the stock market. And then this is just standard. We have a V sub X, V sub X for the drift. Oh, by the way, this, this DT term is called, this DT term is called drift. And this term is called uh, diffusion coefficient. So drift and diffusion coefficient, when I say drift, is the component of DT. It is the rate at which the average is going, expected value is going, moving. That's called drift. And then this is the uncertainty part called diffusion. Okay. So, so we have drift time v sub x, then diffusion time v sub x, x, and, and, and objective function integral. We need to solve this problem. And Merton solved this problem in 1973, but solves wrongly for some cases and correctly for some cases. And we're going to get to this soon. Krauss's last shows that when B is less than U0 divided by rho, no bankruptcy will occur. Because if your utility, so remember what happens. When your utility is zero, no, when your wealth is zero, then you consume zero, all the way from that up to infinity. And the utility of that is U zero, and the present value of that is U zero divided by rho. So if you take the present value U zero all the way from here to infinity, it is one divided by rho times U zero. So if I get less than B, then you don't want to go bankrupt. because your optimal solution will do better if you don't go bankrupt, which means that as your wealth becomes less and less, you are not going to put money in the stock market as much. You will all make sure, always make sure that your, your wealth will be above zero all the time. Because you can always put money in a, in, in a, in a savings account and your wealth will remain zero, uh, will remain above zero as long as you're not allowed to consume uh, a threshold value. That's another kinker that comes in because most people cannot sustain their livelihood if the consumption is zero for a long time. So you may put S, where S is a subsistence consumption, which is strictly bigger than zero. Then you cannot, then you cannot avoid bankruptcy if your wealth is too low because you must consume a certain amount 
and market is not giving you so much. So that's another problem that comes in. And there's another paper by myself and Pressman, Pressman and Sethi paper that solved that problem uh, and generalizes the KLSS paper. Um, I will see Pressman in, in, in Israel uh, next week. So, but many times the U zero itself is 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 minus infinity, like in a log like log c. If you look at log c, U zero is minus infinity, and 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 if U zero is minus infinity, there's no value b can be less than minus infinity. So that situation cannot even be maintained for for some some utility functions. There's another thing that goes on. And that says the following. If u prime zero equal to infinity, then the optimal consumption rate will be strictly positive. And I mentioned that in chapter 11 when we were doing optimal growth. I was telling you that this condition is necessary for, for us to have a consumption that is strictly bigger than zero. And that the reason is that if u prime zero is bigger than infinity, then at zero, if you take a little bit more consumption, you get a very high utility at that time. So if you if you look about a guy who's thirsty, almost thirsty to a point of dying, and if you give him one one drop of water, that gives him an infinite amount of utility. He might survive. That's that's a, that's what you mean by u prime zero equal to infinity. That means that person will not ever go bankrupt because bankruptcy is not interesting for him. Okay, and so the the utility function which is popular in the literature is log of c, and log of c satisfies this condition. And if that condition is satisfied, then you don't need this condition c bigger than equal to zero because c will automatically will be bigger than zero. <clears throat> OK, so Merton is correct as long as he has this kind of utility function for which this is true. But he also said that his paper is correct for u prime zero, not infinity. And that's where it is wrong and he makes mistakes. In my book on portfolio consumption, I give an example of uh, uh, there's a chapter which is not which is published recently in another journal. But I give an example of what is the problem with C bigger than equal to zero and why sometimes we need a subsistence consumption. And the reason is as follows, and I will give an example there. Is suppose you're a farmer and and farmer has, uh, you know, farmer has also risk, he, he plants the field and this could give, be treated as a stock market because he, he puts some seed in the ground and then he looks at the crop and sometimes the crop can fail. So there's uncertainty involved in that. So think about a farmer who has a grain of rice, just one grain of rice. And if, if C is bigger than equal to zero is the only requirement and he doesn't want to go bankrupt, then he will eat half the grain of rice and keep one fourth of the rice with him and other plant one fourth of rice. If the one fourth of the rice goes away because it's a bad, bad crop, then he has still one fourth of the rice left. He can eat one eighth of the rice and he can um, keep a little bit more and plant a little bit more. OK, so you can go like this, but this is not sustainable because you cannot sustain your life with a grain of rice. So, so all of these problems require some generalization to subsistence consumption that makes the problem more difficult, but it has been done. Okay, with all those uh, remark, <clears throat> we're gonna go to log C. And with log C, we can remove B altogether because there's no such B anyway. And we will, we will have a problem. Uh, um, we have a problem where there's not gonna be any bankruptcy and there's not going to be any consumption. So they, basically we have a problem in which there is no bankruptcy time and the consumption will always be bigger than equal to zero. So we can remove this guy and put t equal to infinity. 
That's the problem that Merton solves. We solve this problem in KLSS, but Merton solves the other problem, and that's what I'm going to solve. So with all those remarks, which was, which is trying to give you a flavor of the literature that has gone, people have made mistakes, people have got Nobel Prize on literature that have been made that are mistake erroneous to some extent, and, and, and so on and so forth. But in the end, there are seminal papers, they had a lot of, lot of ideas, and that that is why they were given the price they were given. And, and so we now go to that problem of UC log C, B equal to zero, T equal to infinity, and we can solve that problem absolutely explicitly. Okay, so when we do this, we are with this equation, we're gonna take the derivative with respect to C, we don't have to worry about the constraint anymore because C is going to be strictly bigger than zero anyway. Q is not constrained because whatever we are allowed, by the way, this is another problem that I didn't mention to you, but I will mention it right now. I didn't put any constraint on Q. So Q can be negative, which means I can short sell stock. That means I can put negative money on the stock and borrow money from the bank. So one minus Q, so you can go back here. This Q can be, Negative and one minus Q could be more than one, which means I, I, instead of putting money in a savings account, I borrowed the money from savings account and put that money uh, and short sell the stock. Okay. Okay. So I short sell the stock. No, I short sell the stock. I'm sorry, other way around. I short sell the stock, get some money, I put that money in the bank and earn some money. Okay. Earn some interest. I'm hoping that the price will go down so I can buy the stock and cover my position. But I'm not allowing, I'm allowing short sales here. If you don't allow short sales, the problem becomes more difficult again. And Fleming has written a paper on that because then you have to put Q bigger than equal to zero here. And that we are not doing. Merton did not do it, we are not doing it. So we are not putting any constraint. So we can take the derivative of this side with respect to Q and C. That's what we're gonna do. And only those problems will be concerned in, in our book and in the course. Anything more you have to learn, uh, go to the literature and it's it's not part of the course, but it's something that you might want to know. So when we do that, we get, we get Q star X and we get C star X. In fact, we get the formula, uh, the optimal feedback rules for investment and consumption. Okay. And then we have, we have, we have, uh, with respect to Q and C equating the reasonable expansion to zero, we get this, and then we get Q star X and a V star X. This gives you Q star X, C star, you have to, you have to uh, also, uh, why I didn't do that uh, in this slides. Uh, you also have to take the, 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 the derivative with respect to C. And we get this, this will see, oh, you, you get, um, you get C star equal to one by B sub X. Oh, this, this is immediately that. So if you take, if you take log C, it's one divided by C, that's this guy, one divided by C, and one divided by C becomes B sub X. So the derivative of the respect to C is exactly this. So I didn't have to write another equation because it's this equation itself. Here is an equation which, can be solved a little bit like this. Uh, and so I do in two steps. Then I can substitute these guys back into this, this equation, this equation, and remove max. And I get what is called the Hamilton Jacobi equation. Remember, when you have max, we call it a Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equation. When we remove the max, we call it a Hamilton Jacobi without Bellman equation. That equation is very difficult. It's got V sub X squared in the top, V sub X is in the bottom, and there's a log of V sub X. So it is, it is quite complicated. And we were at this problem when I was at Carnegie Mellon um, as a visiting professor for 1978. I went there uh, just to help them out. And that time I was working on these problems with some math people there and statistics people there. And we ran into this problem and we went to a 
differential equation expert in uh, in uh, math department at Carnegie Mellon, and he said there is no hope in hell that you can solve this problem. But <laughs> we were able to solve this problem. And that's why this paper, 1986 paper, is, uh, is considered uh, uh, a big contribution in the literature. Uh, it, it required a lot of effort to solve that problem, um, but it was possible to solve. We needed some transformation uh, in order to solve that problem, and it was finally got solved. Okay. So, what Merton did is what we are doing right now. We don't, we're not doing what KLSS did. We're doing what Merton did. What Merton did is guess the solution. And when you guess the solution, here's one guess. I'm going to guess it. And we will provide you the guess when if I give you an example of this kind or exercise of this kind, because it's not always easy to, to, to make these guesses. Uh, and Merton did it, and uh, he was lucky. And I'm now giving you what he did uh, for different, you can do for different value functions, different utility functions. There are different formulas which allow you to do that. So once I do that, I can substitute this into this formula and find the coefficients. So I, I need to find A and M. So once I do that, I go through this. So I have equal to this. And then by, 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 by computing the coefficients, um, um, equating the coefficient, I can find A. Okay, same. You have a coefficient of x and, 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 and log x and whatever. So you will find that this equation will be satisfied when A is 1 by rho and M is this. So what you see by comparing the coefficient of log x and the constant on both sides, we get this. And by substituting these values back in V sub X, I get this. So I actually solve for the value function completely. And once you solve this, then we have, once you solve this, we have a formula for Q star X, which is given by, which is given by this. I know the V, I know V, so I know V sub X, I know V sub X, X, I can substitute that and I can find Q star X. So the Q star X is just constant. More alpha, you put more money in Q star. That's intuitive. More uncertainty, you put less money in constant. More R, you put more money in savings account and less on this. So you can see this, this makes sense. Completely, intuitively, it makes complete sense. Consumption basically says I will consume a fraction of my wealth each time. So you remember, if you if you if you consume this kind of wealth each time, you will never go bankrupt because it's exponential decay. You will your your wealth will always be, uh, always be bigger than zero. So these are the feedback rules, and the the optimal fraction of the wealth investment risky stock is this. So Q star Q star T at any time T is a Q star or W star T is exactly this for all T. The optimal consumption C star T, C star W star T is rho W star T for all T. Remember, this is a formula for any X whenever I find myself X. But at time T, my wealth is W T star. So my X is W T star at that time T. So this is what I'm consuming. I'm consuming a rho. If let's say rho is 0.1, then I'm pursuing 10% of wealth each time. So if I'm rich, I, I spend more, consum more money in consumption. If I'm poor, I put less in consumption, proportionally less. So there are literature where if you have a fixed cost, you have to go to impulse stochastic control. If you have jumps, you get into martingale problems. Uh, there are manufacturing problems. There's a book by Sethi and Zah um, that, that goes into manufacturing problems with these kind of processes. Uh, application to finance, there's my book, and there's Karachi Shri book, and there's Ben Susan book again. Application of marketing, uh, there's, in my book, there's, a, there's some stuff, and there's a book by Tapiro, 
and the application of economics. So there are a lot of applications of Brownian motion equation, Ito equation, uh, which are listed here uh, in this. Okay, I'm gonna to go to chapter 13. Are there any problems here? Any questions that you want to ask? I'm looking at um, Okay, so let's go to chapter 13. Can you see the slides? Can you see the slides now? Yes, Professor, we can. Yeah, good, because I changed the slide. So sometimes it's you have to stop and reshare it. So good. So the chapter 12 and 13 extend the book into two different directions. One, you go into stochastic problems, which is chapter 12. And chapter 13 extended to games where there's more than one player. There are more than one decision maker. And when in continuous time, such games are called differential games. And they are dynamic games, but they are not discrete time and they are continuous time games. And game theory is becoming quite popular. For a long time, the game theory was not that popular because the problems were very difficult. Explicit solutions were hard to come by, but now it's becoming fashionable again. And, uh, and uh, uh, supply chain um, problems where we have games um, are quite common now <clears throat> because there are more than one player involved. So we're getting there. And since I also do stochastic differential games, I decided to put all of these together into the final chapter. In other books I had game theory chapter before stochastic, then stochastic chapter, then stochastic games. So there will be three chapters, one game, stochastic, stochastic. But now I remove the game chapter and put it, the game chapter into this, and it's just one chapter, differential games, both stochastic and deterministic. And I think that's a better way to do it. So I am going to go into saying that now with the game theory, we begin with the simplest games, the simplest games are, oh, there's a little bit of a history here. If you, if let's, let's go a little bit about that. Uh, Isaacs, Rufus Isaacs, uh, studied differential game from the point of point against maximum principle. So there is a, there is a connection with differential games and optimal control theory. So the differential games are actually the generalization of optimal control problems in cases when there's more than one controller or player. But the objective functions are far more complex because you don't know anymore what the objective function should be like we knew in single player problems where we maximize profit or maximize utility or this or that. So there are different kind of concepts called solution concepts, Minimax, Nash, Steckelberg, and there are other slew of different possibilities called cooperations, bargaining. Uh, there are papers by Tolwinski and Hori. Hori is when I put it there because I have written several papers with him. So the, the simplest games are called minimax games or zero sum differential games. So we'll cover them first, and then we will cover the Nash games in 3.2. And then we call the Steckelberg games in section 13.3. So this is our program for today. And we may not be able to cover everything, but we still have another session or two sessions, but we will talk about that briefly later.
So let's take two players. And one player plays U, the other plays action is B. So our state equation in chapter two becomes X U V T instead of X U T. So that's that's first extension, uh, which is easy to see because I have another player and it's it's the action also affects X. The second thing is we have no problem here. We put U T in some set U and we put V T in some set V. So we assume this to be convex. So it is not a big deal here. Then we have objective function, which depends on U and V. It is S of X T, zero root T, and some value that is you have to integrate. Now, what the minimax says is the player one wants to maximize this function, whereas player two wants to minimize this function. And because one wants to maximize, one wants to minimize, the sum of their objective function is zero. Because if you take plus here and a minus, plus plus and a minus minus, you sum them, the sum is zero. So zero sum game means my gain is your loss. Okay, that's so what's going on. Okay, and this term is very popular in the literature as well. This this term has now gone into the English literature where people will tell you zero sum game as, as a language in, in something. You don't say minimax in the literature, but you can zero sum game. So what are we looking for? We're looking for optimal U star and V star such that these two inequalities are satisfied. What is the first inequality says? First inequality says that so, so, so U star V star is called equilibrium. It's a minimax solution. It's also minimax equilibrium. And this says that U star, uh, this says that, uh, let me, let me, let me, let me, no, the first one says, uh, just have to think a little bit. The first says that, uh, because I, the first guy is minimizing, the second guy is minimizing. So the first one says that second player, the second player, if he changes his, if he changes his V star to V, he's going to lose because his, he wants to minimize this. And if he changes to V, that is bigger than that. So this is currently the equilibrium. Everybody is sitting here. And then, and if the second guy wants to change, while well, the first guy stays with U star, remember it's one by one. The first guy stays with U star, the second guy will change, he's gonna lose. So that tells you the first condition. The second condition says, this is the equilibrium. And if the first guy changed from U star to U, then he's, he's gonna be less than that, but he's gonna maximize. So he's gonna lose as well. So this equation says that if, the first player changes, he loses. The second player changes, he loses. So these two inequalities basically says the minimax solution. And maximum principle is very simple for this. You have one Hamiltonian, you have one objective function, lambda dot, and all we're doing is reduce this problem to the Hamiltonian level problem, okay? So remember, in optimal control theory, I once I have the lambda, I maximize the Hamiltonian at each point in time. Right, that's that's my goal. So right here, once I have a lambda, I, the first guy will maximize the Hamiltonian at each point in time, the second guy is mag minimize the Hamiltonian at each point in time. So what's going to happen is the necessary condition for U star V star to be a minimax solution or the equilibrium is that this Hamiltonian is minimized by V for V and maximized by U and U. In other words, we have this inequality. This inequality is almost the same as this inequality, but it's at the Hamiltonian level. You see there's a V here, lambda is same for both of them, T is the same for both of them, but here's a V as V star. As you can see, here's a V and here's V star, and, and here's a U and here's a U star. So here is a U and a U star. So we can, we can do, we can take the derivative of H with respect to U and a V. 
This, by the way, is also called settle point, which we try to talk to you in chapter one. We, we just define a settle point in chapter one. So settle point is useful here. So this, this solution is also called the settle point of the Hamiltonian. So for you, I will let h u u equal to zero and h v equal to zero. That's the first order condition. But u is going to be minimized, so h u u should be less than zero. And this is going to be maximized, so h v v should be bigger than equal to zero. This is calculus. First order necessary condition for maximum and a minimum is this. The second order necessary condition for maximum and minimum are these. So that is simple. Um, the next thing is Nash. So Nash, this by the way, is already done by von Neumann in 1928 when he wrote a book on parallel games. And later on he, in 1940s, he wrote his, his big famous book called Theory of Games and Economic Behavior, which was uh, written with Oscar Morgenstern. It's called the von Neumann and Morgenstern book, which is basically the, the classic book that we, 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 we refer to it all the time. We said, we said von Neumann, Morgenstern utility functions, and those are derived from the book. Um, but they did zero sum. They did not go to Nash. So it was Nash who came up with the idea that there may be more than two players, and each has his own objective function. So now you can see, now x dot has got all the players, all the, now I don't want to do u and v because there are many players and we done not enough letters in alphabet. So I put u1, u2, and un, and players, and i x dot is given by this equation. And each person has his own objective function. By si and fi, I put the objective function. Of course, it depends on all the controls, but there's i, 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 i for, I, I at player. I, it's a very straightforward generalization, but to prove that such games exist, there's a solution, all of that requires a lot of mathematics. And that's where Nash got his Nobel Prize. Uh, the, the, his thesis in which he do this is only 26 page thesis. And in these 26 pages, um, he, he develops the, the, the theory of Nash differential games. And, 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 and that is, the stuff of Nobel Prize. And of course, um, everybody knows about movie John Nash, and you see that there is, there is, he's a popular figure in some sense. Um, I only know that my professor knew him, <laughs> but other than that, I never met him myself. Uh, so we have a UN star, U2 star, UN star. And now that is called an Nash equilibrium, provided that this happens for every i. Now look at the player i. Player i is behaving ui star. That's his thing. And that u star star should be maximum of all of that where this is ui. So maximum over ui in ui. So all feasible solutions, he should maximize, and the ui star should be maximum of all the feasible solutions. Yeah, theoretically, you can take the derivative when the Hamiltonian comes in. So that's that's our definition of Nash equilibrium. Remember, when he changes ui, ui star to ui, all the other people are staying at their equilibrium solution. So what we are saying is, it's a Nash equilibrium. This is a Nash equilibrium. If the ith player changes his strategy, he loses. If the first player changes the strategy, he loses. The second player changes the strategy, he loses. If I changes the strategy and all the others don't change, then he loses. That is the, that is the main idea. One person is changing, everybody else is not changing, then that is a national equilibrium. If, if one person changes while the other person stays the same and he can improve his lot, then he's not a Nash equilibrium. So there's, there are two ways to define Nash equilibrium. One way is to, you lose when you change. The other one is, if you gain by changing, then it's not a Nash equilibrium. So one defines Nash equilibrium, other defines what is not a Nash equilibrium. 
Then, then the Hamiltonian, straightforward. And now I have each person has his own lambda. Because in the previous game, same lambda was working with both because they had the same objective function. One was a minus, one was a plus. But in some sense, they were, they were, we didn't need the two. Now we have a lambda i dot and its terminal value, which depends on. So each person is playing almost like maximum principle. Now I have to do the same on Hamiltonian level. You see there's a ui star and there's a ui. Exactly the same as I did here. But now it at each time t. So the each time t and there's lambda. So we could literally, uh, so let's assume that I solve this problem and I get the ui star. Then u star, ui star will be a function of x and t. Because all others are at the star level. So they are all solution of this problem. The only thing that varies is x. So I need to take into account that x and I need to take into account t. So I have a feedback solution, which is the phi i x t, which is a solution of Hamiltonian makes such problems. So I'm taking derivative of that with respect to ui. So look at when I take the derivative. Okay. Here's the problem that you need to know. Lambda dot i. Remember, this is a function of x. Lambda dot i is the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to x. This is this is what we did in all the chapters until chapter. 11, okay? But it turns out that there is another X coming from this guy. Because take the H sub I, which is this, and take its derivative with respect to U I, U J. And U J is a function of X T with the phi J here, which is the phi J. So if I take the derivative of hi with the uj, I get phi, then I take the derivative of phi, the chain rule, I get phi jx. So, so by doing that, I actually have two terms in the, in the lambda dot i. This makes very complicated. So you do a feedback, it's very complicated because this, this, is, this, this is not easy anymore to solve. I also want to say that you can write this as j not equal to i because h sub ui is zero. Because h sub h i u sub i is zero because h i sub ui is the first order condition for this Hamiltonian. Okay, so that that is zero. Uh, so so I can remove j not equal to i. So that one and that one are the same. You can write it this way or this way. It's up to you. So these are also non-zero sum games. And you can sort of see that people are looking for problems where this term is zero. Because that makes it easier to solve. Well, it is it is zero in uh, in uh, zero sum game. So I'm giving you some example. When n equal to one, this is true. We already talked, we already saw this in when we proved the sufficiency condition. So we don't need the cross term. In a two person zero sum game, we also don't need the cross term. You can see the formula here. H1 equal to minus H2, so that this is zero. In the open loop game, when we don't want a feedback solution, we don't want a solution in terms of phi, only solution in terms of T. That's called open loop, which means you don't observe X, you don't react to X, you solve your problem at zero, and you tell the solution all the way to, to capital T. That's called open loop. And those are those are different solutions. In a, so there are two kinds of Nash games, open loop and feedback. Literature has both of them. I have done both of them. And, and open loops are a little bit easier to solve, but they are not interesting enough because nobody reacts to X. And that's not, that's not interesting because people do react to X.
Okay. So I think I, I said everything here. And now I'm going to go to, and, and maybe this is the only thing we're going to do, and then we'll do the rest next time. We did the Colin Clark model of fission. And this is, by the way, is a very cute model. I mean, he, I, 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 I was very fan of this model of Clark, and I tried to put the fishery model of Clark, and partly because I could do that in, in chapter 10 or 11, and I can also do a fishery model in, in, in chapter 13. And feedback solution, not many models are available to do feedback solution in, in game theory. Uh, so, so it is also a good example. So now we have two players in the fishery. One is U1, one is U2. And so X dot is the, 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 the fish biomass growth minus what is caught by the first guy minus what is caught by the second guy. Each person is, is control is limited by one. I want X2 to be bigger than zero because fishery should not have a negative amount of fish. And each person has the same objective function as before. We had a PU times Q times X minus C, but I put I in there because CI may be different for different people. QI may be different for different people. So it's, it's just Q1 and Q2. To get the feedback Nash solution, we need to say a few things. One is that, that let X bar I be the optimal biomass of each person assuming that he is the sole owner. And that problem was solved in 10.12. So we're taking the solution of single people and bootstrapping it to solve the, the game problem. That is, the, that is a nice thing part of it. So we, we need to assume that solution, that we know that solution. So X bar I is where I would like to be, where ith guy would like to be, okay? But the ith guy also has a binomic equilibrium which depends on his CI and his QI. You, you go back to chapter 10, you will see a formula for XB will be C divided by PQ. And you also see that for, for binomic equilibrium, that is the UBI, and you will see that this formula also in chapter, chapter 10. Now, Shown in exercise 10.2 that XBI is less than X bar I. We did that in chapter 10. That binomial equilibrium is, is overfishing and is at it, lower fish biomass than X bar I. And that's why we went and, and solved the soul on the fishery problem because fishery is owned by many people. That will be the equilibrium. Everybody's going to fish until no rent is available to anybody. So that one is what a soul owner would do. So we know that. And we also assume this so that people can, uh, 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 that, 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 that the UBI is less than UI so that we can uh, assume UI to be sufficiently large so that UBI is less than UI. Let's assume uh, with no loss of generality that XB1 is less than XB2. Remember XB1 is the biomass of one guy and the, uh, XB2 is the bio, bio, uh, bionomic equal to the second guy. That guy is lower, it means he's more efficient. That means his CI and PI are better than this guy because he can make profit at this level, at, 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 at above this level. So he doesn't make a profit below this level, but he can make a profit above this level. This guy cannot make it below this level, but maybe a profit above this level. But that means that between these two levels, the first guy can make a profit, the second guy cannot. You see, this is a very important observation here. First guy can still make a profit in between these two levels. Second guy cannot make a profit because he's more efficient. So he can make a positive profit in this, in this, this range while producer loses money in this range, so he's not going to do anything. For XB and XB2, both producers make positive profit here. So we, th there's an implication for that too. Once you learn this, you can see something happens. Since U1 is bigger than UB1, UB1 is possible for producer one. So he can actually drive all the way 
the feedstock level to XB1. He can do that. He can drive it all the level to this level if he wants to. Okay. Which is less than XB2. This implies that producer one will not allow producer two to operate at a sustained level above XB2. That means if the fish mass is bigger than XB2, this guy will fish like mad and bring the level down to XB2. So what he's going to do, if, if he finds himself, if X is bigger than this, he's going to fish like mad <clears throat> for this level of fish mass, and he will fish zero at this level. Maybe he will stop at XB2, and then he will fish zero. This is his, this is his thing. Less than that. Okay. So then what happens? We know that this is intuitively optimal. So we can assume this and rewrite the equations. So, so what do we say? As far as the producer one is concerned, he wants to attain his turnpike level X bar one if X bar one is less than XB2. Because if it's less than XB2, he can go to this level, and that guy is not going to make any profit anyway, so he's out. But if X bar one is bigger than XB two, then if he comes to there, this guy is still fishing because he's bigger than XB two, so he's still fishing, so he's not going to be able to maintain X bar one, right? So if he's not going to be maintain X bar one, the only thing he can maintain is XB two. So what we're saying is if X bar one, which we already know how to compute from chapter 10, we also know how to compute this, we can find out whether this condition holds or not. If this condition holds, then the guy will fish up to XB2 and he will come to XB2 where the number two guy will be out and he will still make money because his, his binomic is XB1. Okay. So this is the U2 star. The second guy, will mad like this and zero like this because there is no other option for him. So now I can write a, an optimal feedback policy, but I haven't proved it. I will prove it using Green's theorem, but I can write this policy. And uh, so let me just take a couple of minutes here. The human star is the first guy. What is he going to do? For X bigger than X1 bar, he's going to fish like mad. This is when X1 bar is less than XB2. We know this condition from chapter 10. We have formulas for this. So you can check this. When you check this, then what happens is at X1 bar, he will maintain U1 bar and he will maintain his equilibrium and other guy is out. Okay? Because other guy is out because this is less than XB2. The other guy is not making any money. If X is less than X1 bar, he will fish zero, just like in chapter 10, until the fish mass recovers to X bar one, and he will then just take this amount of fish and maintain X bar one. So that's a good condition for this guy. Okay. If X1 bar is bigger than XB2, then it's also clear. He will fish U1 up to above XB2, and then he will only go to XB2 and then stop. I mean, not stop, he will fish that much, but he will not go below. He doesn't want to go down below XB2 because he wants to be as close to X1 bar as possible. And the other guy, after XB2, if X and XB2 is going to zero, other guy is not making any money. So that's a feedback control that we know. And how we do we prove it? Well, the formal proof, this is, this is the condition that we need to prove. Formal proof goes like this. We know the U2 guy. We know this guy, okay? So we can write this right away. So we can do the following. For X bigger than XB2, this guy is going to do U2. So I find a new G1X, which is a new growth function, which is GX minus that, because we know what he's going to do. And for X less than XB2, he's not going to catch anything, so it's GX. So I have a new G1X, because I already factored in this. And then I apply Green's theorem to this guy. And if I like Green's theorem to this guy, I'm not going to do it. But you, you can sort of see the, 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 the solution that I'll get will be exactly this. 
Okay, so we have G1 less than zero, X bigger than X big two. G replaced by G1 can be shown that the new turnpike level produces one is case. That's all we have to show. Remember, Green's theorem gives you a turnpike level. Now with this G1, the turnpike level be min of these two guys. And once you have min of these two guys, that and that are both part of the solution. Okay, that that's that's then the solution of the U1 star X. You only remember you only need to find U1 star X by using Green's theorem. U2 is already done. So uh, there are a number of things you can think about. First of all, that you producer switch to the own optimal system U1 bar. The other thing is if there are many producers, then one by one the fishermen will drop out, and in the end the most efficient fishermen will remain. With the end two will remain, and then we can apply the model of uh, uh, Clark, and we have a solution for that. However, if there are two, if there are two exactly equal, which is not always possible, uh, but if there are two exactly equal, maximally efficient producer exists, then fishery has no choice but to convert to binomial equilibrium, because both of them are equally efficient, and they will drive the fishery down to. It's almost like, it's almost like open fishery. Yeah. All it says is that open fishery, n will come. Then n minus one, then n minus two. Eventually, only two will remain, and they will continue. They will drop it down to minus, and then nobody will make a profit. Even they will not make profit. So that's the solution for that. Uh, okay, I'm. I mean, this is this is minor. It's just saying if there's a nonlinear mortality function, then instead of qi ui, you can do this. But then we cannot solve the problem in closed form, but we can still write the con necessary condition for Nash equilibrium for this. So that's kind of a Nash. I will go into more Nash later. Uh, I will do advertising and then also go to Speckleberg. So that's that. Okay, so we're going to stop that. I think that here's what I want to do. I am an, I'm going to not going to do the class on 28. And I do the class on May, May, what is the next class, which is May, May 5th. May 5th is the class. So May 5th is the last class. Uh, 28 is no class unless if someone wants to go over, please let me know. And when I come back, I can have a class. Uh, uh, I can have a class between May 5th and May 12th or between May 3rd and May 12th. We can have another class if necessary. Uh, you can, the course will be covered, but if you want me to hold another class, I will do it. Uh, you can bring questions and we can answer those questions if you want. That's possible. Uh, so May 5th is the class. May 12th is the final exam. Please make sure that no question from the final exam will come to the qualifying exam, okay? The final exam will be will will disqualify all those questions into the into the disqualify. It will disqualify them for the qualifying exam. Okay, all five of you are taking qualifying exam this 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 summer this time. Yes. It's four of us, professor. Oh yeah, four. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. So you you will take all that exam. Okay. So that's that. Okay. Professor, now I want to give you. Yeah. And uh, professor, I, I've I've already talked to you about my qualifying exam. You don't remember what, that? What 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 you say? So since I wanted to leave, it's gonna be like my qualifying exam will be the exact will be the final exam. The same. This is I mean I already emailed you about this before the start of the semester. Oh yeah, you are saying that the, whatever you grade in the final. Oh, so you're not doing the qualifying, right? Uh, yes, yes. Okay. Not, yeah. Okay. So your exam will be just the final exam. Yes. And then whatever grade you get uh, will be somehow. Uh, will give you, uh, will give you the go ahead or not go ahead, right? <laughs> yes, you told. Okay, me. I, 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 I only can say good luck to you, um, I, I, and I think that it's. I hope that you benefited to take this course again, mm -hmm. and and maybe that this this will this will uh, help you to to get over that, and we hope that you uh, 
uh, you leave this place with your PhD instead of leaving without a PhD. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for letting me. Like, okay, again. let's do the homework part. Uh, I already gave you the homework. Yeah, you gave it due. last week, Professor. Yeah, but, so yeah. now I want to give you the homework that is due on May 6th. Okay, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, no, no, May, May 5th, I'm sure. So the homework is 12.6, 13.1, and 13.3. I think I gave you 11.2, 11.9, and 12.5 last time, right? Yes. And that was that was due today, right? Uh, well, actually, it's due no, next. It was due next week. 11.2, 11 11.9, 11 and 12.5 okay. is due next week. So yeah. please make that due on 28th of April. Okay, even though sure. there's no class. Sure. Yeah, yeah, sure, Professor. Yeah, yeah you can still do, give it to Gotham. Gotham can still have a tutorial on uh, whatever the tutorial session that he has. So you can give that give, give that to him on the tutorial. And then the, the, the one I'm giving you now is due on May 5th. Sure. Okay. okay. Yes. Yes. Clear. So everything clear. Um, and and so, um, I don't think that we need because the what is left is only part of thirteen, which can be easily covered on May fifth. And I will then not go through the motion of teaching you from a hotel in Israel on 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 uh, on twenty eighth. Okay. I, I prepared everything. I got a laptop, Surface Pro, everything is done. So I I could do Teams from Israel and do it, but but it, 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 I prefer to not do it. And and we can always do it uh, if necessary after. But we'll see what happens on 5th of May. We will cover everything. Oh, 5th of May, we have only a little part of Chapter 13 to go. So you can, on 5th of May, Bring in other questions you have from from uh, other chapters. If you have, if you have difficulty following that, we can go over those. I will have all the slides with me. I can do that. Also, on the fifth of May, uh, you may ask again the question about qualifying exam. Okay, is that okay? Yes, clear. Yes, Good. yes, professor. Yeah. Okay. If I give you some idea on qualifying exam, I can give you at that time. But I have no questions right now. I have not formulated the qualifying exam, so I really don't know what to say. OK, Professor. Sure, we'll be looking forward to the class on 5th May. Yes. OK, good, 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 good. Uh, thank you, we'll Professor. You on May 5th. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I just said thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. OK, <laughs> I am. Uh, I, I'll see you. Later. Hopefully I'll see you when I come back. OK, take care. Yeah, enjoy your trip, Professor. Bye bye. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. yeah, bye. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.